Hello and welcome once again to the Reefer Madness Show. I'm your host, Mike Callahan, and thank you so much for joining us today. We've got another great episode coming up. Uh, we've got Dr. Uma Donna Balan, better known as simply Dr. Uma of Uplifting Health and Wellness in Native Mass. You can also find her at TotalHealthCarePHC.com. She's brought two of her medical cannabis patients with her here with her today. <laughs> and uh, they're here to share their stories with you as well. Uh, Mr. Glenn Hogart with some interesting facts and figures, and Mr. Carlos Richardson, Chief of Staff of Super Ego Clothiers, a line of hemp clothing you can find at superegoclothiers.com. We've also got links on our website if you need to find any of our guests and their websites, uh, thereefermadnessshow.com or simply thereefershow.com. Dr. Umer is very active in the medical cannabis uh, speaking circuit, and you may have heard her compassionate speeches at the various events throughout the universe. Um, she'll be a keynote speaker at the upcoming 2016 New England, New England Cannabis Convention at the Heinz Auditorium in Boston, April 23rd and 24th. You do not want to miss this event. Trust me when I tell you, it's unbelievable. Uh, she will be there speaking on both days. Um, you really should make an effort to get there. So uh, we hope to see you at this event, and we will also be hosting live call-in events at, um, in the future, television programs where you can call in and ask the doctors and the patients directly with any questions you may have. So sign up on our website for further details, and now back to the studio and our guests. Callahan, and we're here today with uh, Dr. Umar and one of her, her patients, Glenn, and uh, Carlos. And we're here to discuss uh, medical cannabis and the current treatments that are available uh, today, hopefully more commonly very shortly. And uh, so Dr. Umar, if you'd like, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your practice, what you do. and Mike, thank you so much. And this is a great pleasure and an honor, and especially Today, in where we are facing with the opioid epidemic, um, this is a great topic to be discussing. Uh, my background, I am presently a cannabis therapeutic specialist. My background is as a family physician and occupational environmental medicine physician, and I'm also a medical review officer. Uh, I practice in Natick, Massachusetts. My approach is a total health care approach for patients. Um, I have been writing recommendations in Massachusetts since August of 2014, but I've been writing recommendations since um, 2012 in the state of Washington. Okay. And uh, presently, the name of our clinic is Uplifting Health and Wellness, and we are located at 127 West Central Street in Natick, Massachusetts. Okay. Well, we first met, it was back in um, 2014, the first New England Cannabis Convention at the Park Plaza uh, Castle in Boston. <clears throat> that was a great show. It was. You know, I'm from the baby boomer generation, and the old days, you'd roll a joint and pass it around, and that was it. I couldn't believe all of the, the how far it's come, the different methods of ingestion, the uh, dabbing, the vaporizing, and uh, it was the first time I ever tried a vape pen. It was one of the uh, uh, people walking around the convention, he was, and it was like smoking pot for the very first time all over again. It was a completely different effect. Absolutely. So you basically, um, your patients that you deal with uh, have various ailments, I'm sure. Uh, a number of, um, it's quite, a, quite an assortment of uh, ailments that it helps. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, Mike, you bring up a lot of good points. You know, my practice is primarily I see patients over the age of 18 and above. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came from a background where the average patient I saw in primary care, and most people can agree with this, is uh, I call it the party pack of five. Mm -hmm. They're on a blood pressure medicine, they're on a cholesterol medicine, a diabetes medicine, they're taking something for reflux, uh, or GERD as it's called, and something for anxiety or depression. And these are just to name five of them, and never mind what patients are able to get over the counter. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see now is that I have was able to learn about this accidentally, actually because in my 30 plus years of formal education, I had never heard the word endocannabinoid 
nor did I know that there was a system in our body. Mm -hmm. And most healthcare professionals don't know this. And my patients, I'm proud to say, each one of them know the endocannabinoid system and how this works. Um, and you mentioned that why it works for so many ailments. And this is because what we found out is that the endocannabinoid system is a mere 600 million years old. How could you have a system that's 600 million years old and not learn about it? Well, what we've learned is anything that has a spinal column or a vertebral bot has this system. And if somebody said to me, what would be one word to describe this? I'd say homeostasis or balance. And Dr. DiMaggio has put this so beautifully. He says the endocannabinoid system is meant for us to relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. Those are five very important words. Yes, they are. I know I'm, I'm a medical patient myself, and um, initially, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but um, back in 84, I was uh, hit by a car. It was a breakdown lane, and my left arm was 60% severed across there and severed tendons, and, uh, and I was on some heavy medication for quite a while, mm -hmm. and, uh, which the side effects weren't very pleasant. Not at all. And I didn't realize I was being a medical marijuana patient, but I found myself more and more often resorting to turning to that to help uh, the, the chronic pain and the insomnia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, it, there is, uh, it definitely serves a purpose. Absolutely does. And you brought up a couple of different things here, uh, chronic pain, insomnia, and using it. And uh, I always say I have three sets of patients that walk through the door patients that uh, have never used it, to patients that have been using it all the time, and patients that are coming back to it, um, that they used it you know, 30, 40 years ago and life got in its way. Yeah. And they could not use it because they had to go to work, they had families, and drug testing. And therefore they stopped using it. But what they found is that they don't want to be on the prescription medications and the side effects that they get from the prescription medications. And here was something that is illegal federally to this day, but we have 23 states that have accepted this as a medical piece. And they have been using it and found that it's killed nobody. Nobody mm -hmm. has ever died from cannabis. Mm -hmm. And we have people dying, and uh, Glenn will give you some statistics um, as to the number of deaths. But it is helping so many patients. Mm -hmm. And I made this statement more than two years ago, <coughs> cannabis is not an entrance drug, it's an exit drug from pharmaceuticals and narcotics. Yeah. I went through a probably 30 year span without, if I had an ounce of pot, it would last me a year, mm -hmm. probably five years. And then two years ago, I was uh, once again a victim of an accident. I was in the crosswalk and I was a hit and run by uh, the wife of a Boston sports celebrity and uh, suffered many of the same symptoms, the chronic pain, the insomnia. So that's about two years ago, I turned back to it once again. and. Uh, find a lot of relief in it and uh, so Glenn yes, tell sir. us tell us your story what do you uh, got to say well Mike uh, <laughs> for 20 years I've been uh, I've been a professional ADHD coach which also involves medicine that can be abused and there are a lot of people saying oh well people don't really need it and that well I've been coaching mostly students and I can tell you that similar to, to cannabis there's so much there's more ignorance than there is knowledge about this subject and used properly in the right conditions, it can literally take a, a, a student dropping out and help them pass. In my case, we take a, someone who was a, unintentionally addicted to opium pain medicine, even though they were small dosages, taking four a day for years, basically my life stopped. And I got my life back when we, when I, first of all, I went through terrible withdrawals and, and, and got off of it, and then I realized I had so much pain, certain periods of pain I couldn't exist, so I had to have some as reserve. And coming here, moving to Massachusetts has been a, a boon to me because there's a space now between being so medicated, I'm out of my gourd, you know, lying in bed, which is fine when I can't move, to being able to function, but, not, but, but have it work for the pain, unlike medicine, uh, aspirin or uh, Tylenol, which doesn't do anything to me. 
So I was able to be th this patient who converted from being addicted to, when they hand me opiate med medicine, they might as well say, yes, if you take this, you're going to become addicted. And if you get off of it, even if you don't need it, you're going to have to suffer. Well, who wouldn't love to sell something who, if someone stopped using it, would punish them for stopping to use it? I mean, what a position to be in. Not, not saying that that's why they're doing it. But it puts you in that position of where you almost have to take it whether you need it or not, or suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. I've made a decision that I would try put up with some pain and try to medicate with cannabis with using tinctures and all these ways which you talked about. I used to smoke like you did when I was an old hippie. Now there are tinctures, there are topicals you can put on when my back is sore. I have a topical I can put on. There are different things that work for different conditions and there is a myriad of conditions because the system, the CBD system, goes throughout your whole body. People are using it for things I never even imagined and having success. Sure, some of them are placebos, but most of them are not. Mm -hmm. 28,000 people died in 2014 from opioid abuse, right? Out of a long survey for over 10 years, they, uh, 520 people died of opioid abuse who were, who were just 20% of the patients who saw doctors who were prescribed pain medicine. So 520 of, of millions of patients, uh, uh, I don't know how many there were, I'm sorry about the, st the statistics, but if you prescribe pain medicine, you were a doctor, 20% of those patients in that study uh, were prescribed opioids and 520 died. I mean, how can we be doing this when there is an alternative? Yeah, I think it's political. That's all. all. Only reason I can discover is it, it started in the 60s, it was political. Well, and then follow the money. Uh, and follow the money, right. Big, big we wouldn't love to sell a product that you're going to suffer if you stop using it. You know, that's a very excellent segue into that most physicians, including myself, did not know that doctors actually wrote a prescription for this medicine. It was in our pharmacopoeia, the Bible of looking up a medicine, until 1942. And most physicians don't know that uh, it was used so commonly, companies like Eli Lilly, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies like Merck had made these and into different forms of tinctures that you mentioned and it was very commonly prescribed and it's been around for thousands and thousands of years it goes back to the days of China where we knew it was treated for gout, malaria, forgetfulness and all sorts of joint pains which we still know it helps for and the reason that I also want to understand that this should be an option for patients. It's not for everybody, but it should definitely be a first-line option. And it's not being as a first-line option because it's in Schedule 1. Which makes absolutely no sense. Yes, and for people that don't know what that is, is that Schedule 1 means that it's a, a drug that has no medical use, that it has no medical research in the United States, and the potential for abuse. And right now, cannabis is listed along with heroin, LSD and ecstasy. And again, cannabis kills nobody. Nobody's ever died from cannabis. So, it's very, uh, it's bewildering, well, it's not bewildering because we know why they're <coughs> doing it and it's for the money and, and that's rapidly changing very quickly and hopefully <coughs> with November's election, a um, ballot initiative coming up in November, hopefully we can get it overturned and or the prohibition overturned and get it legalized for responsible adult use? You know, Mike, I would say it's about more than just money. It's a lot about just a lack of information, Education. ignorance. I will say for myself, I had a lot of preconceived notions when I moved here. And what I discovered uh, going to the support group that Dr. Uma has and at the Northeast Cannabis Institute is there were hundreds of people who were using all these different products I'd never heard of and treating conditions you know, and I thought, you know, there's hope here. There are people here who had no hope, who now have hope. And I, I wish, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our VA it, it, it has stopped, uh, you know, it has a major problem with opioids and veterans. Uh, and they have now made it impossible for a VA doctor to prescribe cannabis as an, as an alternative. I mean, our drug czar still supports cannabis as a gateway drug to something else. Well, you know, everyone drank milk too. You know, is milk a gateway drug? Yeah. And especially with the with the vets, um, yeah, I'm a vet. It's, it, the P, uh, PTSD. PTSD. Exactly. And that's just it, it's the best thing for anxiety I've ever found because yeah. ADHD people have a little low level of anxiety anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, 
it, uh, you know, with the right dosage. And, and titration is important here. And that's another reason you go to a doctor for medical advice. The mm -hmm. idea isn't to get as stoned as possible. The idea is to get the pain manageable and be able to function. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a cannabis patient and not an opioid patient anymore. And that's sometimes true. the micro doses, smaller doses work better exactly. than... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. In five minutes, the little buzz you might get goes away, and, but the pain is gone. It's just gone. It's not subdued along with the rest of your brain. The pain is gone and everything else is fine. So Carlos, what's your story? Um, <coughs> thank you for coming today to all of you. By thank the you way. for having thank me. Thank you for having me. Uh, I converted as well. Uh, I first became an opioid patient uh, back in 2010, I think. Um, I was I attended Wesleyan University um, in Middletown, Connecticut, and I was playing varsity squash. Uh, at one of the one of the tournaments, I had torn my lateral meniscus, uh, and so, you know, I had to, you know, stop playing squash for an extended period of time, um, go through physical therapy, but they also put me on opioids, and I kind of went into a, you know a mode of depression um, because squash was my passion, and I wasn't able to, you know, fulfill that passion essentially. Um, afterwards, I, I I didn't even. Uh, I spent another two years at Wesleyan and I didn't play squash. Um, I gained 40 pounds. Um, and last, back in July of the summer, uh, 2015, um, I started uh, trying to re-engage just the sustainable living mentality. Um, and I met Dr. Uma a couple years back, but I had really um, developed a bond with her son, uh, Savaji, and he, try to get me on a on, on a nice routine um, of sustainable living all across the board so I was able to drop the opioids essentially um, convert to cannabis as my primary source um, for you know for for reducing ailment um, and since it's been what nine months since I've been maintaining this this well-balanced mm -hmm. diet um, and I've lost 60 pounds since then mm -hmm. uh, 50 percent body fat mm -hmm. wow. the, you know the, the results have been magnificent um, and I'm sure that, you know there's other lurking variables like a well-balanced diet healthy exercising but all those lurking variables have been essentially stimulated by me maintaining um, you know marijuana consumption um, and ridding myself of you know opioids uh, it's, uh, completely. Just so much healthier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and like you sure. said, nobody's ever died from it <coughs> that that we know. Well, I mean, it's foolish stuff. I mean, yeah. he, he, he do something ridiculous like jump off. But it's it's essentially no deaths from it. And uh, we're going to take a quick break for this very important message. So please stay tuned. And afterwards, we're going to head straight back to the show. There are thousands of dogs and cats housed in shelters that need your help. Local shelter professionals and volunteers give their heart and soul to help unwanted animals and deserve your support. Americans give millions every year to national animal organizations, but unless you give to your local shelter, you can't be sure that money will make it to the pets that need it most. Adopt, volunteer, and give to your local animal shelter. To find your local shelter, go to humaneforpets.org. And now back to the show with the good Dr. Uma and her guests. And we are seeing that patients are, um, the faces that we see, that's your aunt, that's your mother, that could be your sister, your doctor, your lawyer, your child's caregiver. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is not patients that are just trying to be the concept of high. I look at it as healed. They want to be healed. Mm -hmm. And my concept is, as you said, it's not just cannabis. We talk about breathing, about eating right, hydration, being engaged. And my patients will tell you, there's three basic things. You've got to journal. I tell every patient, you've got to journal because this is not about any other prescription medicine where we say, you know, you have this ailment ailment so take this medication twice a day for a week and mm. this is your treatment or if it doesn't work we're going to add another pill to it and it can work and everybody's different and I always say low and slow or very low and slow and you got to got to got to hydrate before you medicate because we know about the side effects of this medicine can make you have a dry mouth can make you feel like the dry eyes 
panicky, all the things that could be the side effects of just pure dehydration. And so we want to make sure people understand the importance. Mm -hmm. And I also sit and I breathe with my patients. Mm -hmm. I teach them how to breathe. Simple techniques that they yeah. can use anywhere. Um, about good nutrition. She teaches Posture. us three, there's three main things. It's uh, educate, embrace, and empower. And the, it's, it's really cyclical because she, you know, we get educated about, uh, and informed about the, the benefits of marijuana. Um, we embrace it. Um, we go to these patient support, you know, caregiver groups. We, uh, then we were able to empower ourselves by becoming actual medical patients and it becomes cyclical because we're building the community organically by then educating others and telling them, like, this, these are the benefits, you know? So it's amazing. Um, I, and I'm happy to be a part of the generation that actually gets to see that, that, that transition and conversion. Right. And um, that's great. Yeah, one of the, um, especially you mentioned the proper dosage. <clears throat> it's not slow, small, and slow. Um, right over there, we've got a, a nice little kitchen set up. We can do uh, <coughs> cooking shows. Mm -hmm. And I made a batch of um, <coughs> uh, pot brownies <coughs> and uh, pot cookies. Uh, no problem. I, I would, uh, frankly, like to work in this thing where March 31st, this was published. So that's yes. this just yesterday, the day before. President Obama's in Atlanta at a heroin summit. While he was there at the summit, the State Department of Health in Iowa said that 19, during while he was there, 19 people died of heroin and 33 died of other opioid overdoses. While he, the president was speaking, or there at that conference. It's crazy, I don't know, I, I, I don't understand it. I'm sorry, I just don't understand where the problem is. Because when a patient um, can get for three dollars or five dollars of a co-payment, a 30-day supply of oxys, and be that patient, I think, is high. Oh well, I used to have that. Yeah, right. That used Versus to be me. a patient that has to come and see me, mm. pay out of pocket to see me, right. pay out of pocket to get their medicine at right. a dispensary, right. and still not have any of that covered, and be on disability. Right. This is where it's and a vicious cycle. it takes two months to get it done, by the way. Oh, to get the actual card yes. and be able to go yes. to a dispensary. It's insanity and it's criminal. And um, it's in Schedule 1. And to me, it needs to be descheduled, completely descheduled. Not rescheduled in any way, shape, or form, descheduled, completely removed off of all the schedules that were created in 1970 where it was placed when it should not have been in Schedule 1. It's long overdue. It needs to be descheduled. Yeah. We had um, Jim Borgensani, the uh, um, information officer for the uh, campaign to regulate cannabis like alcohol, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. But even descheduling is better than that. Pre Canada, uh, I won't say which one, one of the candidates in October 28th call for descheduling cannabis because otherwise you're still going to be dealing with prohibition of some sort you know of these crazy things and people will get caught in the seams and if believe me there are there are people who will find those seams and innocent people will be hurt mm -hmm. i've heard of a case of someone who is using hemp seeds not cannabis seeds that can get you high to make cbd for people who need it for kids for seizures it's apocryphal i just it's just hearsay but i heard it in the sport group that person was arrested by the police, has to go to court, it will probably be dismissed, but look what happened to him for trying, just trying to help someone in a healthy way. I, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, doesn't make any sense. No. Well, hopefully with November's election, that will be a good step in the right direction for sure. Um, even for many of the patients that uh, need it and just, like you said, don't have the money to go get the, um, the recommendation and the card and the time that it takes if they could just go to a local mm -hmm. dispensary and uh, buy what they need and try the different types that help them best. Right. And I really believe that this is also, uh, DPH needs to start getting more involved with this because we have patients that are dying that don't have the two months um, to wait to get that card before they can get their medicine. Mm. There's got to be an easier way. when. We are protocols, listening. which you call for. So all the doctors have a protocol. You go in, you see them, you do the protocol, and boom, you're done. How would and that be? We would like to see more doctors that are certified in doing this, not mm -hmm. just anybody writing these recommendations, but we need doctors and the whole healthcare providers, 
everybody to understand that we have this system in our body, that our body produces its own endocannabinoids. So when we talk about cannabinoids, we talk about endocannabinoids, phytocannabinoids from a plant origin, i.e. cannabis, and synthetic cannabinoids. Synthetics are what are made in a lab. Too much of synthetics will kill you. Too much of the plant or from our own body will not. But they work with these receptors. And there's two primary receptors. We call it can cannabinoid receptors one, which are primarily in the brain, and cannabinoid receptor twos, which are primarily in the immune system. But again, we know these are throughout our body. And you mentioned that it works for so many ailments because these receptors are throughout our body, our immune system, from our kidney to our liver, to every part of our um, organ systems, and even on our skin. And that's why topicals, the different delivery systems, and we could talk about that, why it works. Yet, why doesn't it kill anybody? It's because there are no receptors in part of the brainstem that controls our breathing and our heart rate. So that's why zero deaths. Oh, yeah. Because unless you have respiratory depression, i.e. somebody can't breathe, or cardiac arrest, i.e. your heart stops beating, nobody dies. So those are the reasons why this doesn't. Now, if somebody wanted to try though, they would have to smoke a joint the size of a telephone pole in 15 minutes. <laughs> it ain't happening, okay? And if somebody really, I would love to see the study happen and we can all sign up, right? <laughs> but no, so to tell you as far as toxicity, it's not a possibility, okay? One of my, um, another favorite causes, cause of mine is animal welfare. And I see that uh, it's also used with animals, ointments, um, for Absolutely. various mm -hmm. skin problems they've got. They have a spine. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely, the vertebral column and the, and the spinal cord. So that's it. let's talk about delivery systems. So three primary delivery systems we talk about. We talk about inhalation. That means, i.e., breathing it in. Mm -hmm. We talk about ingestion, i.e., taking it in through our body and having a process and then topicals or other delivery systems, and we'll touch upon that. So inhalation, we think about two things. And you mentioned the good old days as far as rolling a joint or smoking it out of a pipe. Uh, but now there's this whole concept of vaporization. And when we think of vaporization, we think of Vicks vapors. So something you put in the hot water and you got the vapors. So that's the same concept as far as what we're doing with the flower, i.e. what we call weed or the different bud that you can take this and actually, instead of combusting it, i.e. burning it, you are heating it to a point where you get the vapors. And it's a much cleaner process mm -hmm. without having all the irritant contaminations. So those are two delivery systems. So either one is a good, easily titratable system, i.e. one puff can do you, that's fine. If you need another one, it can take a second one. And it's very quick acting within minutes and short acting up to minutes to hours. And it's easily titratable. Instead of saying, you know, start with, I say start out low, start with one puff. Mm -hmm. What works the best for you? If you need more, take another puff. And then ingestion, we talk about edibles, tinctures, uh, sublingual, um, there's beautiful type of candies, lollipops, brownies that you mentioned. There's a whole delivery system of edibles. And again, understanding that that the impact can be longer for the impact to be felt, but it can last longer. And again, I understand that there's a chemical transformation. What is considered THC in the form of Delta-9 um, is now changed to 11-hydroxy because it does go through a process. And the worst reactions I've seen of this is somebody puking their brains out, and that's not pretty. So hyperemesis, we call it, increased vomiting, and it's a cyclic type of vomiting and I've seen this with edibles, or paranoia, anxiety, and again, somnolence or feeling very tired, but again, low or very low and slow, and again, when they say wait an hour, wait two hours to so start out slow. And topicals are a great uh, delivery system because there is no psychoactive effect of it, and you can apply it and you can reapply it, and I've seen this not only for pain, but I've seen this for patients with psoriasis, eczema, different type of topical reactions, even my patients that have had wounds that have not healed. It works excellent. People with skin cancer, different types of cancers, it works very well for. 
So and topical is a very good delivery system as well. Mm -hmm. And other systems, there's suppositories. There's now rectal suppositories, vaginal mm -hmm. suppositories. There's nasal inhalers. There's uh, inhalers mm -hmm. that they're using. There's a whole concept of drops, and we could talk about. There's a whole array of delivery systems as well. Mm -hmm. I noticed when I. Um, made the brownies. <coughs> it was a pretty good batch. Nice. And uh, <coughs> an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half go by and, and uh, I only took a half a brownie so I wasn't sure because of how strong it was. And uh, shortly thereafter it was it started kicking in so I, it, I didn't need to do the other half. That's so. right. And, uh, and as far as the amount of doctors that are uh, our, on our last show, Dr. Eric Ruby, the only pediatrician authorized, mm -hmm. uh, certified in the state of Massachusetts to treat patients under 18 years of age. And he's overwhelmed. And, they be, and so many of the people, that's the pediatricians that he works with, they, they don't want to touch it. Mm -hmm. It just terror, it scares mm -hmm. them. They're worried about the, uh, the regulatory mess that they could be getting into. And it's They've made it very difficult. <coughs> if Dr. Ruby, Dr. Ruby and I have spoken several times about this. I'm a family doctor. I could be doing patients under 18. And I can't keep up with the patients, and I only see about 68 patients a day, because in order to do this the right way, you need time. And I spend an hour easy with my initial patients and follow-ups, or at least 30 minutes. And it's the paperwork. And as you said, there's a lack of doctors, there's a lack of education about this, and for pediatric patients who need this, they have to find two doctors, mm -hmm. two signatures, and everything is paper. I mean, you talk about difficulties. And they're deprived of a relationship with their doctor, these patients, whereas we have a, a great bond. Each, each, each patient of Dr. Uma's can, you know, can go on and on about um, how great Dr. Uma is. Like, my, my primary uh, care physician prior to Dr. Uma, like, I didn't, I don't, I couldn't tell you anything about her, essentially, you know what I mean? And I'm sure that's, that's the case across the board. Um, it's, I believe this time problem is an insurance problem, driven problem, although this doesn't have to do with insurance, but with ADHD, we, we say the same thing. If you go in for an ADHD diagnosis and you leave with a prescription in 15 minutes, find another doctor, because that doctor did, does not know enough mm -hmm. about you to prescribe anything. Yeah. It mm -hmm. could be, you have to eliminate everything else it could be, and I'm sure Dr. Uma does the same thing. But you can, you know, um, if all you want is to get a medical marijuana card, sure, you can do that. Mm -hmm. That's why they need to deschedule it. Why mix those people up who, who just really occasionally, maybe they want to have a drink or maybe they want to smoke a joint. That's, that's one group of people. There are people who have serious ailments, who, who need a relationship with a, a physician, who don't need to jump through hoops, who don't need to follow laws that are almost designed as if they were laws you would write if you didn't want someone to do whatever activity they were making legal. It, right. it, it seems as if it, it might as well be illegal for all practical purposes. So I think there needs to be two different kinds of spaces created. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Really. One with protocols, titration, logs that you keep, what worked, what didn't work, because honestly, I can't remember from, from three days ago, I don't know. And so by having these logs, uh, Dr. Uma is so good about what she does, and I can transfer the knowledge of, of my 20 years of ADHD work right here. It's the same Wild West where, you know, all kinds of weird things are happening, and you need to find a reliable source of information that you can trust and then follow that. That's my belief. We started a patient caregiver support group, and I say we meaning when there was such a need for a patient's when I started in August of 2014, we did not have the dispensaries open at that time. And it was criminal because we had le allowed this to happen, a rule passed in Massachusetts in January of 2012, and there was no dispensaries two years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until um, mid-2015 that we had the first dispensaries open. And now we have six dispensaries that are open. But the patient caregiver support group if you, I would love for you to come Mike, and visit this, and I'd love to, love to tell you a little bit more about it, maybe. Well, um, dispensaries are not very popular for the reason that they're difficult to use. Some of them, you have to make an appointment. You have to go past this icy stare of a policeman who, who may or may not be Mr. Friendly, Officer Friendly. And frankly, he was very friendly. But <laughs> still, you have to drive a long way. It's not, it's not comfortable, as opposed to this gray area of caregivers 
And the patient caregiver support groups are intended for patients and their caregivers, i.e. their families, because it's not just the patient that has to be dealt with this. And we know every illness not only affects the patient, but at least four other people, at least. And what we're finding out is the lack of information and having safe access. Um, so we want people to know what they're getting. We want people to know that they should have their medicine tested. And I'm not there to support anybody. We're not, I don't tell anybody go to one person or another. Right. This is for people to gather, to get information, and feel like they can get accurate information. And if you see the faces, you would not know that these were cannabis patients. I know of three people that I know now, <clears throat> and their their fathers are probably 70s, 80s. They've got mm -hmm. they'd never even consider cannabis in the past, and they're having a lot of ailments. And they find that mm -hmm. uh, you know half a brownie here and there, some cookies or Absolutely. something. I mean, it's still a little old-fashioned. They may use a pipe, but uh, some of them just are uncomfortable with that aspect, and they they don't mind consuming uh, edibles, and it, it helps them out tremendously. And, and my little old lady sometimes even still like smoking a pipe. They will tell me, I just have a little bit I put in my pipe. And that's, they find that easy to use. But the concept of the vaporizations now have made it much easier, especially with our patients that have disabilities. And they can just push a button, which is easy, and be able I to. I have a balloon, the volcano thing. I have a big balloon that fills with medication. And I can take just a couple of draws from it and set it down and wait. And you know mm -hmm. it can stay there for an hour. It's fine. Hmm. And um, you know, and and I drink. Well, I have a glass of water there. I just keep drinking. You know, I can tell you every patient of Dr. Uma's will tell you me before you medicate, Hot hydrate <laughs> every time. It's like the number one thing. And it's true. I do notice that my eyes feel better. I never knew that before in the old, in the good old days, right? The good bad old days. The good old days. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, this has been great. Um, is there any other issues or things you want to touch on? I, I would really want people to understand, please, um, I always say reach one, teach ten, and my patients do that all the time. Go out and ask. Talk about it. Bring it up. And that's the thing that I realize. I talk about it everywhere now. And when I first got into this, you know, I was like, I'm a family doc. I'm an Ackman cannabis medicine. Now I'm proud to say I'm a cannabis therapeutic specialist and my patients are proud to talk about it. So go ask your healthcare providers, what do they know about cannabis? Yeah, there's a lot to learn. Uh, there absolutely is, and there's good information, and I really thank you for doing this, Mike, and getting the information out, and I thank uh, Carlos and Glenn here to, for being here today. Yeah, same here, thanks guys, appreciate thank it. Guys. And uh, I would like to say to any viewers out there, um, tell as many people you know, to tell as many people they know, and uh, come November, we can get this uh, uh, voted through for legalization. And if you want to have a great weekend, the upcoming uh, New England Cannabis Convention at the Boston Hines Auditorium, uh, April 23rd yeah. and 24th. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's unbelievable. Yes, all from of where the, we came. All the vendors and the, uh, all the pipes and the, the vaporizers. And it's exciting that we are coming to the Cannabis Convention yeah. at the Heinz Center. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Anyway. You meet a lot of great people. Yes. There's yeah. a ton sure. of people. Everybody's happy. They yes. gotta have a good time, make a lot of new friends, and learn a lot of new uh, in ingestion techniques. And uh, Yeah. And check out our website, totalhealthcare.com. Totalhealthcarethc.com. <laughs> yes. And we'll have a link on our website as well. They can get in touch with you if they can't find it. Uh, if they forget, they can go to uh, the reefermadnessshow.com. And uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, appearance here. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. You're Pleasure. welcome. Well, that does it for this episode of the Reefer Madness Show. We hope to see you at the 2016 New England Cannabis Convention coming up in a few weeks on April 23rd and 24th uh, at the Boston Hines Auditorium where you can catch Dr. Uma's keynote address on both days. You do not want to miss this event. Trust me when I tell you, it's a great one. It really is. It's a good time. Uh, so, I want to end this episode with a moment of nature and my little dog, Charlie. Until next time, I am your host, Mike Callahan, and this is the Reefer Madness Show. Thank you for joining us. Please support our sponsor, Star Barks Coffee. 
Uh, don't get caught high and dry without your Starbucks coffee. 100% of the profits support animal welfare and worthy causes for all.